Hello, welcome back to Nursing 341. This session, we are looking at birth related stresses. In this session, students will be introduced to some birth related stresses, especially birth asphyxia, respiratory distress syndrome, transient tachypnea of the newborn, meconium aspiration, and persistent pulmonary hypertension and congenital disordered cold stress, jaundice, polycythemia, and infection are all part of birth-related stresses. But for the purpose of this uh, video, we will concentrate on birth asphyxia, which is very common in our setup and one of the major causes of death. And then we'll mention also the uh, respiratory distress syndrome, which is also common, and then transient tachypnea in the newborn. All these stresses, you must know, that also significantly negatively impacts the well-being of the newborn at best and needs intervention which is immediate. The goal of our session or goals and objectives for this session is that students will be able to enumerate birth-related stresses of the newborn, identify the factors that influence the birth related stresses and describe the different types of birth related stresses and discuss the management of birth related stresses. But like I said, the key topics are, I have listed here are all birth related stresses. But this session will look at birth asphyxia, respiratory distress syndrome, and then the transient acupnea of the newborn. However, meconium aspiration syndrome, we know, will also be a cause of the birth asphyxia. So we'll see it again here under birth asphyxia. And then congenital disorders, we'll be looking at it next semester in medical surgical conditions. So John, this you have even mentioned last semester. So it's for you to recall and also uh, know that it is relevant in this topic, except that because you have done it already, we will be drawing on your knowledge to, and then polycythemia we have mentioned, an infection which is common with us. So chapter nine of Wong's Essential Pediatrics, which has been uploaded on Sakai for you, is what you should read. Birth asphyxia is failure of the newborn to establish breathing at birth. So the newborn will need to be helped. So resuscitation is an intervention that is carried out to help the asphyxiated newborn to breathe. So that is what we do to help baby to breathe. And we call the golden one minute. It's very, very key in this case. So we'll be looking at what goes in there. The aim of resuscitation is to establish and maintain a clear airway ensure effective circulation, correct any acidosis, prevent hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and hemorrhage. Because when oxygen is depleted, to a large extent, it will also cause some bleeding in the brain and other parts of the body. So it's very, very important that we address this immediately. However, it is important to note that their actual cause is not known, so there are some risk factors. So we'll look at some maternal risk factor. We cannot exhaust all. But rupture of the membrane for more than 18 hours will predispose the newborn to infection. So after 12 hours, usually antibiotics is given to prevent this complication that will result from infection. Bleeding in second or third trimester. Pregnancy induced hypertension because when the blood pressures are high, it also affects the exchange of oxygen and nutrients via placenta to the fetus in utero. So pregnancy induced hypertension results, as a result of the pregnancy, the mother becomes hypertensive and this affects also the newborn to some extent. And then cases where the mother has hypertension, chronic, and it's not properly managed. And then substance abuse, whether it be alcohol, 
cigarettes, we any other form of substance, some mothers may abuse, may also have some negative effects on their unborn baby if in utero. And then some drugs that mothers, by virtue of their condition, be it hypertension, diabetes, and other uh, conditions, some drugs, example I have here, the magnesium, which is given in cases of hypertension, and other narcotics may also affect the newborn. Once again, heavy sedation. When the mother, because of pain, labor pains, is giving some sedation, if it's a bit late and also too heavy, it may also affect the baby by suppressing the respiratory center and may have result in birth asphyxia and then previous fetal or neonatal deaths. So some mothers have the history. So it may also help us to arrange in managing the newborn and also maternal pyrexia. So because of infection of the mother, when she has high fever or temperatures above 37.5 may also affect. So maternal infection, diabetes, and other chronic illness like anemia, and then other cyanotic or heart diseases in the mother may also affect or result or predispose the newborn to birth asphyxia. So it's also very important to note that there is also fetal conditions or some problems that may be related to the unborn baby, so the fetal risk factors. Multiple gestation, so where you have more than one baby, or a mother who is multiparous, uh, has more than one child, is also having the risk, or even twin delivery also is another to consider. And then preterm gestation, less than 35 weeks, the lungs are immature, levels of surfactant may be inadequate and may predispose the newborn to this. post term, the baby might have suffered some intrauterian growth retardation or placental insufficiency in utero and may also affect the baby. And in cases where the baby has enjoyed high levels of glycemia or I would say hyperglycemia because of pregnancy-induced di gestational diabetes or the mother has chronic diabetes may also result in this. And also the same goes for the large for gestational age because the baby there has also enjoyed high levels of sugar or glucose in the blood and therefore may affect them by prolonging labor and may also come out asphyxiated. And then fetal growth restriction, also as a result of placental insufficiency. And then polyhydraminous, oligohydraminous, reduced fetal movement before onset of labor, may tell you that all is not going well. Congenital anomalies, especially cardiac congenital anomalies, and then intrauterine infection may predispose the newborn too. And then we have intrapartum risk factors, non-reassuring fetal heart rates. In cases where the heart rate comes below 60, and then abnormal presentations. We all know that the normal is cephalic. So if it's transverse or breach, it may also affect prolonged labor. The woman laboring going beyond 15, 18 hours may also cause this problem. And then precipitate labor, where the woman labor shortly, very strong contractions may also affect oxygen exchange via placenta and also result in some separation of the placenta and may affect the unborn. And then intrapartum risk factors, anti, antipartum hemorrhages. We're talking about sudden separation of the placenta or abnormally situated placenta, where we are talking about abrocio pla placenta previa and vasa previa are all indicators. And then meconium in amniotic fluid, 
when you do artificial rupture of membrane and then you see that the baby is passing meconium already in utero, it's a sign that there is some degree of oxygen depletion. So that's why the, there, is this, there is also forceps delivery. And then oh, that is aided delivery and then giving narcotics shortly before delivery, less than four hours or within four hours of birth, may suppress the, the, the brain and the respiratory center in the brain and will result in birth asphyxia. And then we have other aided deliveries like forceps delivery, vacuum, and sometimes maternal general anesthesia as we have in cesarean section. So there is a need to prepare. If these are seen, there is a need to have a resuscitator ready with overhead heater because you want to prevent hypothermia. You need very good light and a timer so that you work within the shortest possible time and then towel to dry up and prevent hypothermia. You also would need the cetoscope, the pulse oximeter, the airway management here, you need suctioning apparatus and they come in various sizes. And then you may also need the oropharyngeal airway for intubation. You need a larigoscope. You need some batteries on, on, for spare if they need be. And then you need also to make sure that the laryngoscope is in good shape. You may also need the endotracheal tube for intubation. You may need also to suction. So there is a need for a, a suction apparatus and a laryngeal mask. So for breathing support, you need a face mask and bag. And then the face mask and bag is what you use for the positive pressure ventilation. And then also you may also need some oxygen to you know, augment the air that you give because when you give it alone without oxygen, the levels are lower than when you add oxygen. And then also there is a need for feeding tube to decompress in cases where there is some degree of. And then also you have circulatory support. Here we have the umbilical venous catheter. We need IV kits to also be able to pass the IV line. And then also some uh, sterile water, we recommend that and also even methylated spirit could be used, but you need to clean it after. And then you also need syringes and needles that you need. Some drugs that may be needed if the heart rate is low, you may have to give adrenaline. And then vo volume expanders, normal saline, ringus lactate, these are all intravenous fluid that will help. And then blood suitable if the need be for transfusion and then there is a need for you to document so whatever uh, recording sheets you have so for we have talked about the golden one minute so the first 30 seconds after birth you want to make sure you assess the baby quickly is the baby at term is the baby breathing or crying is the baby's heart rate present you also take that and then the tone of the muscle is the muscle tone good? So the initial routine care after evaluating and finding that all things are normal, here there is no need for where things are normal and there is no abnormality, you just provide warmth by drying the baby, any fluid, and then you wrap the baby nicely and then clear the airway if it is necessary, if it is not. As you dry the baby, you simulate the baby. And then secondary evaluation, second 30 minutes. So that is the 30 to 60 minutes to make, seconds to make one hour. You assess the respiration and make sure the heart rate is more than 100. And then the color is pink. And then in this case, you see that the APGA score we have set above seven connotes that everything is going well and there is no need for active anything. But if baby is cyanotic and has difficulty breathing, then there is a need to clear the airway and begin to monitor the pulse, consider supplementary oxygen, and consider continuous positive airway 
uh, pressure. So in this case, after clearing the airway, there may be the need to give, to bag the newborn with the bag and mask. And if the baby improves, then there is, the heart rate goes up to 100. So as you can see in the picture, the bag and mask is what you see. So the, if the baby is gasping or aphnic, you have to follow these steps. You clear the airway and begin monitoring. You provide positive pressure, but before you do that, you have to extend the air and make sure that the mask covers, is being shaped. We have the nose part and the mouth part, so you make sure you fit it appropriately, and then consider to give oxygen in addition as you bag with under positive pressure, you also augment it. So 60 to 90 breaths in seconds. So the next, this to make sure if the heart rate is, is less than 60, then there is a need for chest compression. So you have to com give the chest compression and then also consider intubation if the chest is not rising. So in cases where the heart rate is more than 60, you have to stop the chest compression and it goes one, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. So that's how you go. So when you give three compressions, you allow for the breathing. So that's one, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. And then continuous ventilation of 40 to 60 breaths per minute. And then where the heart rate is less than 60, there is a need to administer adrenaline 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 milligram per kilogram body weight. And this will also have to add blood expanders, normal saline, and ringer slightate, give 10 mil per kilogram body weight. And if there is a need for blood transfusion, that will be determined by the neonatologist present. So after resuscitation, then we go to routine care. So the routine care involves ensuring that the baby is kept warm. You prevent hypoglycemia, so you have to do the heel prick and assess and make sure the level is not below 2.6 millimole per liter. And then the baby needs to be referred to NICU for further care. So you have to transport the baby. If the incubator is available for transportation, that is available that it is used. If not, you wrap the baby well and then in the company of a relative, you accompany the baby to a bigger facility where neonatal intensive care is present or care is available for further and communicate with the family and document care. If nobody is available, you communicate to them later. So this is an algorithm that will help us to do all that I've described. So it tells you if the heart rate is below 100, if it is yes, ensure that the airway is open. So this algorithm, if you look at it, it will tell you what to do. And then some nursing diagnosis that we can formulate in cases like this is ineffective breathing pattern related to lack of spontaneous respiration at best, secondary to intrauterine asphyxia. In nursing assessment and diagnosis, we're saying that you have to observe the infant. And so one of the major nursing diagnosis we can formulate is ineffective breathing pattern related to lack of spontaneous breathing or spontaneous respiration at best. So, or you can also relate it to intrauterine asphyxia or you can relate it to pet asphyxia. Another is decreased cardiac output, especially when the heart rate is below 60, related to impaired oxygenation. Another nursing diagnosis you can formulate is ineffective family coping because the family here will be stressed. So that will be related to lack of spontaneous breathing of the newborn at best, or they will be related to fear of losing the newborn at best. So that takes care of, so at the end of the day, you should be able to formulate some nursing diagnosis. Now we'll look at respiratory distress syndrome, which is also common. So here we are saying that inappropriate breathing, respiratory adaptation in extrauterine life, and this refers to a highly membrane disease. 
and here you have deficiency in pulmonary surfactant. So we're saying that the levels of surfactant in the preterm infant is very minimal and because of lack of the lungs or underdevelopment of the lungs and this results in this condition. And it occurs more frequently in infants less than 30 weeks of gestation. So in Ghana, here is highly compromised and they may do well or thrive in some setups, the private setups that are well uh, resourced. But once again, with the modern incubators we have in some hospitals, they may not thrive in some hospitals, but may thrive in some hospitals in Ghana. So it occurs more frequently in the premature. So this is one common condition that you see. Prematurity is one contributory factor and also surfactant deficiency or underdevelopment of the lungs. So some complications associated with this condition are hypoxia, respiratory acidosis, me metabolic acidosis. So when this happens, you see that there is decreased uh, levels of surfactants and so that causes what we call atelectasis, where you have the lungs dense. Instead of allowing gas exchange, now it becomes very solid. So there is some sort of cell death, and so there is lack of gas exchange. And then it leads to hypoxia, and the hypoxia further increases the acidosis because of lack of surfactant, and therefore causes pulmonary vasoconstrictions. And some of the symptoms you see that show that there is some difficulty is that the nurse, that is this area of the nose flares out. You have also the lips all going blue. We call that chemosecumeral cyanosis. You have expiratory grunting and then you have retraction and that is in drawing of the chest. You have also fast breathing, tachypnea, heart rate going up. And in terms of nursing intervention, you want to maintain airway and also give some oxygen. So supplementary oxygenation will be done by nasal prongs or catheter or by the CPAP or we also will give by intubation or endotracheal intubation. And then there's the need also to replace the surfactant by reducing the complications such as pneumothorax. So this is also administered through an endotracheal tube and the surfactant treatment may, may be repeated several times during the first days until respiratory distress syndrome resolves. So you must, we must also go by what is prescribed. Once again, nutritive support. We have said that the breast milk is the best for the newborn. So once again, tube feeding, it, must, it can be passed through the mouth depending on the degree of gestation. If it's extremely premature, then parenteral feeding, total parenteral nutrition where everything will be given intravenously to the baby and may, um, NASA or tube feeding may be contraindicated in the extreme premature. And then support from parents. They must be part of the care and we must allow the parents to feed and hold in cases where the baby can tolerate feeding. And then we must also allow them to hold them and involve them in the care and inform them at each phase of our care. And this will help them and reduce their anxiety levels and help them to also collaborate with us and give their baby the full support needed. So clinical management, our primary goal is to prevent preterm births through aggressive treatment of preterm labor and administration of corticosteroids to enhance fetal lung development. So postnatally, we want to maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation by giving oxygen 
and then where there is a need to go further with endotracheal intubation, we do that, and then correct the acid-base imbalances, and also provide supportive care and maintain homeostasis, because as Ill illness is not able to make the body keep the balance, so we give the necessary care in terms of nutrition, total parenteral antibiotics, whatever, the problem is we identify it and treat it appropriately. So oxygenation, we have said that, and then blood gas monitoring will tell us and help us to correct any acid-base imbalance, and then nutrition, we have talked about that, and then prevention of infection. Another thing we have to assess for is cyanosis. In cases where the breaths are 60 or more than 60 breaths, that connotes tachypnea, and so we have to assess that. And I said in assessing, this, the best way is to auscultate rather than count, and then granting respiration, flaringness, significant retraction and labored respirations are all elicited and then documented appropriately. And then if the baby is flaccid, hypotonic, unresponsive to stimuli, all these should be documented and reported for appropriate intervention. And then seizure may also connote that there is a possible deterioration or some central nervous system damage, sometimes maybe irreversible. So the family needs to be informed to gain their cooperation and also prepare them for specialized care as the baby grows. And there is also impaired gas exchange in cases like this. So impaired gas exchange related to prematurity or respiratory resource, respiratory distress syndrome. And another nursing diagnosis we can formulate is altered nutrition, less than body requirement, also related to respiratory distress syndrome. And there is also the risk for infection related to prematurity or respiratory distress syndrome. These are all nursing diagnoses you may be able to formulate. So try and formulate more as you go along. This is your references and this is where we end today's discussion.